feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Shrimp Tank, where every week uh, I'm your co-host, Ted Jenkins, with my co-host, Lee Heisman. We bring you some of the brightest and best CEOs, not only in Atlanta, but around the United States and across the country. It's not uh, every day that we get to talk to an international CEO, but we're really excited today to bring on our guest, Mario Knopfel. He's the founder and CEO of the IBC Group. We're going to talk all about cryptocurrency today and things that you need to know. But as always, we're doing this on Zoom today, but for those of you that have been uh, downloading uh, our show, we continue to move up the ranks on, on all platforms, Spotify, iHeart, what we're seeing in uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We're now in the top 10% of all podcasts in the country. And that was really exciting for us when we started this with our first entrepreneur. And now talking to entrepreneurs that have you know scaled and built their own net worth by building companies and serving others and creating lanes and spaces and all kinds of things like that. And it's just exciting. This topic in particular, uh, having Mario on today, is really exciting because there's so much that's been discussed now about cryptocurrency. And I thought just to begin the show, because you know so much about this, and yesterday in the news and what has been filling the news for the last month has been the collapse of FTX and you know potentially how Binance is involved with this. But yesterday, Sam Bankman-Fried, I call him the fro because he's got the big afro. <laughs> and and uh, he uh, he got arrested yesterday in the Bahamas. And there's just a lot of speculation about, was this a legitimate business? Uh, did he do something criminal along the way? I don't know, Mario, how you can look at a camera and say, I have no idea where $5 billion was because... I have companies and I know where $5,000 are, let alone $5 billion. So what do you, what, can, is there any way to break this down for the audience? You know, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs and investors on here about what, what happened and what this is. The story is a lot crazier than what you hear in the media. And I, I don't say this lightly, and I don't like to make up things to, to kind of make it sound sensational. It took me a while to realize how deep the fraud is. And I'm calling it a fraud because we there's more than enough evidence to call it as such. Now there's um, the SEC just announced um, they're charging him with, with securities fraud as well. That was a few hours ago. I had Sam on my show a week before and we chatted about a week, oh. a week ago. And I knew Sam even before all this, not personally, but we, we've crossed paths and my team have met his team and have met him. So, Number one, the amount of money that is unaccounted for is significantly more than $5 billion. And, and the reason I'm saying this is uh, there's two guys. They were on my show yesterday and they were on my show a week ago and, and, and before that as well during the implosion. They've been investigating Sam for nine months. And what's crazy is that they gave me like a data room that includes all this evidence because they've been investigating FTS for nine months. And things they knew about months before the implosion, we're only finding out today. For example, there is two days ago, three days ago, all of the all of the crypto world was up in arms because one of the top publications, just like uh, let's say Bloomberg in in the traditional uh, um, finance market, it's called the Block. And the Block, we just found out that the CEO received a sixty million dollar loan from Sam. Oh. We oh. don't know why. And he used it to buy properties and stuff. That was literally sure, three, four sure, days ago. And every few days, we're finding out more and more. There's things that are too speculative that I won't mention. Now, why am I saying this? First, it's significantly bigger of a fraud than we think. Number two is I, I, obviously innocent until proven guilty. But with the evidence we've seen, it's very difficult to, against, to argue against intentional fraud. There's too many indicators towards it. And there's a lot of other parties involved. Mario, just for people who are out there and listening to this, you know, there there are some people that still don't get crypto, right? Some people have gotten their toes wet, invested a little bit of money in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, how do you, how can one know the difference between a legitimate exchange today and one that could be illegitimate? Is it is it hard for a consumer because it is still an unregulated, uh, non government intervented type business? Yes. Anyone that says otherwise is lying to you. People within crypto, including us, some of the smartest people within crypto, 
had their money on FTX. We didn't have our money on FTX, but had their money on FTX or trusted in FTX. FTX was like you're talking about the NASDAQ or you're talking about Lehman Brothers. You're talking about even bigger than Lehman Brothers, JP Morgan today. That's how big FTX was to the crypto world. Now, number one is Binance. They're 10 times bigger than FTX right. uh, or they were at the time. FTX was number two and a very well-respected exchange. Now, when you go to the retail market, I'd say this. You've pro if you've been in crypto, you've probably been burnt. If you haven't been in crypto, you're probably scared. That's everyone in the retail or just, just because of what you're seeing in the press. Very normal. Happened in 2018, happened in 2016, 2014. I, I, it happens time and time again. Events will lead people that are not within the space, even people within the space, to start getting scared. The technology itself, like SBF and FTX, is not a crypto problem. It's a fraud problem. It's right. the Bernie Madoff of crypto. Crypto has got so big. And why did we have such a big fraud so early in the industry's uh, maturity? That's because the lack of regulation. So it makes fraud a lot more common within crypto. Now this is changing. Like I've had a lot of regulators and, and premiers of different jurisdictions come on the show, on my show. And they're, they understand crypto more than most people expect them to. And the regulation is now coming. I think this is the this is the straw that will break the camel's back, which is good for the industry to allow it to mature. Uh, and hopefully we will not face a similar implosion to FTX, at least not in the short term. So, Mario, let, let me say, first off, congratulations for so much success. And, and I'm not going to say at a young age, but when you have two old men sitting in front of you over 50 <laughs> years old, it's, it's fair to say at a young age. But I want to speak about the roundtable because it, it looks so intriguing. What I really love looking at your site is it isn't just discussions, but you use the word to debate as well. And I really love that piece of it because a lot of people, they have conversations. I want you to speak about the roundtable, but I love the fact that you lean into that word debate as you promote it. And it's, it's, it's aggressive it's, yet respectful. Guys, the world we live in is so polarizing. It's crazy. It's insane how polarizing it is, especially if you go to the U.S., like I, uh, so we're facing, have you been listening to the Twitter files dropped by Elon Musk yeah, on Twitter? Yeah. So we've been covering this live. We've had Elon Musk on the show a couple of times and to talk about it where we, 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 we literally opened the space. It's a Twitter space. It's like a live show within Twitter. Open it up as soon as the drop starts. This is one of our segments and we'll be covering those drops live. And it's, it's just fascinating to see how split people from the same country are. Like we're going to be covering – the next drop is going to be covering Fauci and the vaccines. Right. I'm petrified on how to cover this topic because I try to be objective. I try to get my biases and my opinions and my emotions out of the way because that will allow me – if I'm the host and I'm biased, that doesn't allow for an objective debate. So I try to get objective debates, both sides of the story. doesn't matter what my opinion is. And I've done this for different aspects of crypto. I've done this for um, – Obviously, the Twitter files, I'm doing this for the January 6th, um, even the term, I don't even know what to call it. Some people call it revolt, some people call it insurrection, some people call it riot, <laughs> some people call it just events. I've not, like, this is how polarizing the world is. So what I'm trying to do is, look, media is biased, obviously, some more than others. They're not all in the same basket because of their advertisers. You know, we talked about FTX. Some media outlets admitted months before the FTX implosion, they didn't look into an investigation, into reports concerning reports from FTX and they said it explicitly because FTX is a big advertiser and like it's understandable they got bills to pay so at a, a, a media mainstream media is biased but social media is not much better either it's full of echo chambers it's just a bunch of uh, accounts that block anyone that disagree with them and there are a bunch of people that all agree on on a particular topic and they all it's just like a big circle jerk that everyone agrees with everybody so what i try to do is i try to do a space where there is healthy disagreement. I'm, I'm not involved in the debates. I just ask questions to try to educate the audience. And I tell the audience, I'm like, guys, if you're listening to me and you agree with all my guests or if you agree with everything I'm saying or everything my guests are saying, then we're doing something wrong. My goal is to make you feel uncomfortable. My goal is to make you question things that you believe in. It's a very difficult thing for any human to do. Very difficult, but it's an incredible so, skill to have. Um, so, so that's you, what I'm trying to do with the show. 
there are a lot of people who still don't understand uh, the world today of cryptocurrency that that may be money, so to speak, when people think about Bitcoin and the blockchain. And I know that you're, you're you know, you're an expert in this world of, of Web 3.0. Would you be able to give just for neophytes out there and people that are saying, I, I know one day that uh, I, you know, in the internet, I could buy a domain and I don't know why I was buying domains and some of them are worth millions of dollars now. And, and where, where does, what does web 3.0 mean to the average person out there? I'm going to give you a spiel you're going to really enjoy. The audience is going to really enjoy because <laughs> I've, I've, I've traveled in so many countries saying this, so I'm, I'm, I've become really good at it. So I'll, I'll talk about a concept called NFTs, which everyone heard heard of, but everyone exp- imagines it to be a collectible or an image. So I want to kick it off by saying NFTs has nothing to do with collectibles and nothing to do with those images, nothing at all. NFTs, which is a concept of cryptocurrency, and it's probably the foundation of Web3, not probably, it is the foundation of Web3. NFTs means, it's a technology that means digital ownership. That's it. Now, what do I mean by digital ownership? I'll give you an example. These AirPods are mine. Why? They're in my house. They're in my pocket. I don't have a certificate to prove they're mine, but they're in my pocket. Physics, which allows the earth to operate, allows me to put them in in my pockets, which makes them mine. So that's how you own something in the physical world. If I go to you in the virtual world, which we're all spending, you know, we're doing this virtually. I spend hours a day on my spaces virtually. I run my company virtually on WhatsApp. You know, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I'm on uh, uh, Spotify for the podcast. This is a virtual world. People listening to this are in the virtual world. You're not listening to this face to face. You're listening to this virtually. So we're moving more and more as technology evolves into a virtual world, spending more of our time. If you have kids, you'll see your kids in Roblox and playing games hours and hours, hours a day. And they even build relationships. They have girlfriends and boyfriends within those games. Their entire life, everything they we used to do in the physical world, they do in that virtual world, everything. So now that we know that we're living in a virtual world, how do you own something in the virtual world? Because the virtual world is essentially a replica of the physical world, whether it's socializing, signaling, building a business, building a relationship. We do those in the physical world. Now we do them in the virtual world. But how do you own something in the virtual world like you do in the physical world? Well, the way we've done it so far is through centralization. What do I mean by this? Well, YouTube says you own that video. They give you copyright rights. Instagram says you own that photo. A bank says you own those numbers on the bank. A game says, if you're a gamer, a game says you own that gun they have in the game. But you don't really own it because if the game goes bust, the gun is gone. If the bank goes bust, the numbers are disappeared. Uh, if the if YouTube goes away, the YouTube are gone. So YouTube videos are gone. So technically, the things that you think you own, you don't own them. The entity legally owns them, and they just say you're. You, they just give you the ability to use them. So then it goes. All right. Well, how can I technologically own something? Well, in 2017, the concept of NFTs came in. It allows you to own something. I'll give you an example where this is going to relate really well with the audience. We're spending our time more and more in those games and in what I call metaverse, which is that virtual world, which is going to become more immersive. If you've watched Ready Player One, you'll get an idea of what I mean. It's going to become a more immersive world. As we live in that world, you'd want to own things. You'd want to own the clothes you wear in that world to show off your identity, to show off that you have money, to show off your your personality, whatever it is. Or you want to own, if it's a world where you can actually play games, you want to own that spaceship in that world where you can actually travel from one planet to another, whatever the world is, you can go to, that's a gaming world, of course. If it's a business world, you want to, you want to watch to show, you know, people wear watches that are worth, you know, half a million dollars. You can wear a virtual watch to show, Hey, I'm rich, which is like a a form of signaling in a meeting. But now you want to own this watch because you want to move from one world to another virtually. Like in the physical world, I travel all the time. If I wear my watch and I go from Dubai to, to, to the U S I'm going to have that watch on my wrist in Dubai. I'm going to have the same watch on my wrist in, in the US. You know, physics allows me to wear it all the way there. So in the virtual world, NFTs as a technology now allows me to own my assets, not the game to own them and lease them to me. I can technologically own them. I can prove this is mine. And anyone that copies it easily could be proven this is a copy. You cannot copy things anymore because tech- you can see in the code, very easy to prove that this is the original one. So when I'm wearing my watch, and I go from one world to another. I'm giving you a very simple example. I go with my watch from one world to another. 
with my identity, which is, hey, I'm rich. Or if I have a spaceship and I want to go from one game to another, I own that spaceship. My, my game could go bust. It could collapse like a country collapsing. Many countries collapse in our physical world or you know, go through tough times. And you can leave that country with your assets. Well, now you can leave one game to another, go to another game with that spaceship, with that asset. Too. So to conclude what I'm saying, now we have the technological ability to own something virtually, whether it's an identity, whether it's a spaceship, whether it's financial instruments, whether it's real estate, whatever it is, you can actually own it. It could be yours the same way like you have something in your pocket or in your house here in the physical world. And that opened up what we know as Web3. That opens up massive, massive, massive opportunities in a way to live in a virtual world without central entities running that world and telling us what we own. So that's what really excites me. That's why I'm, I'm doubling, tripling down on crypto despite the bear market, because I just see the potential of that technology known as Web3. And I understand what NFTs are beyond pictures and collectibles. I hope I didn't get too, <clears throat> no, go, didn't go too deep. No, I Mario, that's great, great information. I got to ask questions, Ted, as well, because Mario, you know, again, as I mentioned about all of your successes in such a short amount of time for you, and I love the fact we talked about the bait in your, in your program, of course, and how if someone is listening and they love everything that they hear, you know, you're doing something wrong. You, you travel the world, you meet some of the best leaders across the country. I have to ask a little bit about you. And, and I understand the tech that's out there. You're giving us a, a little shortcut, a cliff notes. Years ago, Mario, there was something called Cliff Notes, and there was a little yellow book that we read our, I'm joking, I know we're so old now compared to the rest of the world, but I want the Cliff Notes of, of you, and the reason I ask that question is, I want to know when was the last time either in business that you've been uncomfortable? You seem like you're very confident, very comfortable as you dialogue about all these topics that you know, but you talked about your audience needs to be a little uncomfortable listening to your show. I would like to know for our listeners, when was the last time, Mary, that you found yourself uncomfortable in a situation you did not, you wanted to get out of, but you may, might have known it was best for you to stay in and learn more? I'm in it right now. <laughs> I'm in it right now. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. A year ago, I was living a very comfortable life. You know, I do biohacking every day. I'm going to do it right after this interview. Um, you know, all these different things to, 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 for, for health and anti-aging. So I used to do this every day. I used to go to a festival to dance bachata, which is my hobby. So I get invited to festivals. Every couple of weeks, I travel to a festival as an artist. And I, you know, crypto was blowing up. Like my, my portfolio was worth 20x what it is now. And that was, and that's crypto. You got up and down. Now, my portfolio has gone down by 90%. I'm talking about my crypto portfolio, which, again, doesn't surprise me. I've been through it before. My portfolio is down 90%, but that's not where it gets tricky. That's fine. That's part of business. But at the same time, suddenly, out of nowhere, my show that I used to do uh, twice a week, um, now we used to have 50,000 people listening to me per day, now you know, went up 5, 10x, and I'm getting all that attention, and I'm doing it every day. Whenever there's breaking news, I come up and do a show. And I do it hours at a time because there's just so many people listening. And I just have people jumping into my space. And that's completely changed my life. Right? Look at me. It's nighttime. I woke up three hours. I woke up at 4 p.m. today. And that's early. The day before I woke <laughs> up at 6 p.m. Uh, a few, um, two months ago, I was waking up before the FTX thing happened because that's what blew me up. <clears throat> I was waking up 9 a.m. having a beautiful normal day. So I'm in a very uncomfortable position, position right now with the attention I'm getting. I'm getting threats. I'm getting hate. People I don't know, like for no reason. But just because we, you know, we call out a lot of people, we're, we're kind of doing a lot of investigative journalism, and I didn't expect that attention. I didn't expect the, uh, you know, I, I, you know, security risk is pretty common in crypto when, when, when you're a name in the space. But to that extent, I never had it. Um, and when I discuss polarizing topics, like we're going to be discussing COVID in two days, because that's what the next uh, Twitter file drop will be. Very, very polarizing topics. So getting doctors that have different, uh, d uh, different opinions about the about COVID to come on. But it puts me in a very tricky situation with a lot of attention towards me. And if I slip up with anything, I'll be getting uh, – and that's pretty common whenever you have a lot of attention. Um, and that's a very uncomfortable position to, for me. I was uh, My comfortable life has been turned upside down at the moment. But it's part of the process because I'm, I'm, I have a certain goal to achieve, which includes getting a big audience. And it's part of the process of what I'm trying to do. Um, and I'm not, uh, look, I'm, I'm just embracing it. Like, I don't need to do this. I'm financially very comfortable. I have a very normal life. I'm an introverted, happy dancing um, business owner that owns businesses within crypto and outside of crypto. Like, I have a good life. Yeah, I'm still doing this because I still want to, uh, you know, I, I love progress. I love momentum. And I'm doing this. 
So for anyone listening, if you're in an uncomfortable situation, there's a quote that I'm going to paraphrase. I think it's by Tim Ferriss or he's quoting someone else. And it goes something along the lines of, if you're not doing something that makes you uncomfortable, you're not progressing in life. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I, I was curious about your your take on this. You know, obviously, uh, Bitcoin was, you know, at 60 plus thousand, you know, uh, Ethereum had spiked, uh, the levels have come back down. Do you believe that that regulation is the is the path that will make cryptocurrency soar again? Or do you believe that there's a path that it could soar again on its own without regulation, given everything that's gone on in the last couple of months uh, uh, with, uh, you know, exchanges that have failed? Yeah, so so crypto will soar and um, will likely soar, nothing certain, will likely soar either way, with or without regulation. It's because of the technology and because of adoption. But will that growth be sustainable? Will we avoid issues like what we had with FTX and and more to come, like the dominoes are still falling. Unlikely without regulation. Regulation and laws, as much as you hate governments, regulations and laws are there to compensate for our imperfections as a species. Like, we're, like for example, greed. We're extremely greedy. We're extremely fearful. We've got herd mentality. We like to witch hunt whenever we don't agree with something. Like, There's just so many things that are wrong with us as a species. So regulations are purely systems there to allow us to function to our, at our best despite those imperfections. So when you go to crypto, uh, greed is probably one of the more common imperfections or biases that hurt the industry. Sam from FTX is a perfect example of this. So regulation is there to avoid these issues from happening. Are they perfect? No. Do we need them? Yes. Could we evolve to, an, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a place, to a position where we don't need regulation anymore because we code regulation into the blockchain? That's what everyone is trying to achieve in this space. Hopefully, that's what we're trying to do. It's an experiment. If we get there, decentral, it's called, you know, we can call it decentralized regulation. If we get there, then it's going to be pretty pretty cool, uh, but it'll take a significant significantly longer than we expect. Innovation takes. You know, people underestimate the overestimate the short term impact of innovation and underestimate the long term potential. So in the short term, everyone expects crypto to change the world. No, it's not. Same as the internet it takes time. Long term, the internet changed our world a lot more than anyone imagined uh, 20, 30 years ago. So Mario, I love, Ted and I have been doing this now for seven years. And again, well before podcasting got Respect. popular, right? Well, well before people would make fun of us seven years ago. And we have, we have three <laughs> studios. We have three studios where we are currently. And we have 15 other studios of ours across the country in different cities in, in the United States. So we're one of the first people, again, before it got real popular. I love watching this and listening to you because Ted's very business driven and I'm driven more on the person. So we always have this yin and yang. So I've been biohacking for years, Mario, and I heard you say that. So uh, I love it. You know, again, you know that that popularity, right, of the cold plunge these days. I've been ice bathing, Mario, with CEOs up at my property for many, many years, well before it got popular. So I am very much into the biohacking, the molecular level. I've been doing things for years, as you said. Challenge yourself, or you're not growing. And I've been fortunate to travel this country and even the world uh, over in Switzerland at Chinot. I don't know if you know that facility. But there's a number of facilities. So for listeners out there, knowing I am such a fan of this, I want to find out what are your top two biohacking tips for entrepreneurs? Man, like the the the, the person just walked past me now. She manages my medical team and she knows everything like the back of her hand. I'm going to connect you to uh, Dave Asprey's coming on my show in a few days. David Sinclair as so well. Let, let me interject. Um, I know Dave. I know Dave. Um, top sleep doctor in the country, Dr. Michael Bruce, a very good friend of ours. Sinclair. So Bruce came on to our show, Mary. I'm sorry to, to say this. So love it. You know, I love sleep it. is so important. I met Dave many, many years ago with Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, eat fat, get thin. And Dave is amazing. And, and obviously he sold Bulletproof. So many, many years have been a part of my life. That's amazing. So I want to know what your top two biohacks are. Yeah, man. I, I'll, um, they're pretty basic. Like I know there's a lot of exciting things from stem cell to hyperbolic chambers to cryotherapy, red light therapy. Uh, there's just so many things. Every day I usually do uh, full body cryo. I do the uh, LED red light therapy, whatever you call it, the, the chamber I sit in. Sure. My team knows what they're called. I do stretching. I do 
facial cryo and I do uh, sauna, infrared sauna for 30 minutes. So they're the things I do every day. Uh, NAD drips I do once a week. NAD drips, highly recommend them. They're very, very good. Absolutely. Uh, and other forms of drips. Uh, but I'd say the top three biohacks instead of two are basic ones so the audience could do with or without money. Number one, as you said, Lee, sleep. Way underrated. Sleep, making sure that it's dark. Put your sleep mask if you need to. Um, obviously, sleeping time is important, but sleeping enough hours is, is the most important. So sleep is number yeah, one. Mario, I have to jump in. We're, we're going to be talking. Sleep is a process. People think you just turn off. It's actually a process. You have to get ready for an hour to two prior to going to bed. So people oversee that all the time. I love that. So important. So important. So important and underrated. Number one is sleep. Number two is stress. Avoiding stress, which I'm, I'm working on all the time. Um, very, very important. Having people around you is also really important. There's a TED speech I watched years ago, and they're talking about how the number one um, cause of death, um, and and uh, you know from natural causes, uh, other than like sudden death, is um, not not smoking, not eating. It's it's a lack of human interaction, loneliness. So having people around you is really really important. So that's something I, I started doing three four years ago a lot. I, I live with my team in a big. I, I rent big places and I live with my team. Um, so, and, and the last one is eating well. Again, I know it just sounds very stupid, but if anyone's listening, I promise you, like the, the, the importance of eating well beats any other business advice anyone gives you. It's so important. Yes. And what does that mean? It means um, having a healthy diet, preferably Mediterranean diet, but that's you know very tricky there. It's just a lot of great diets. Um, but just eating lean food, avoiding burnt food, avoiding processed food, um, and burnt food, processed food, and one more I forgot, which you can, it's a very basic one. But if you do those things, um, those sleep, avoiding stress, eating well, and having people around you, avoiding stress, having people around you, I put them together, um, you've got an 80, 90% of um, biohacking or, or a, 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 uh, aging reversal. There's a lot more things you could do. Some things cost a lot of money, but that's a good starting point. Well, this is uh, this is great stuff, and uh, I'm a fan. I'm going to start listening and uh, watching your shows. I, uh, I I love what you're talking about. Uh, I think this is how you get better in life for all of our listeners and viewers that are watching this. Is you surround yourself and you start following people who are doing all those things: biohacking, creating companies, learning how to maximize their fullest potential. So, for people that are on here today, how can they start following your show, and how can they learn more about you and and all of the companies that you're running, including IBC. I just Google my name, Mario Norful. Um, best thing to go is on Twitter. And then there you can go into my spaces. It's a pretty, pretty crazy experience because we do them live. It's like 300,000 followers somewhere in that, that uh, thing now, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's like, yeah, I, like four, five, six months ago, I wasn't even on Twitter. Um, but yeah, so the live shows are really fascinating because it's like you're watching breaking news. So whenever something major happens, like the missile that landed in Poland, obviously the FTX implosion, now the Twitter files, yesterday Sam getting arrested, we immediately kick off the space, you know, tens of thousands of people join and we start watching the news and talking about it. And a lot of experts join because we know a lot of them just come on and imagine like there's a new strain of COVID and everyone's talking about it. Immediately we open the space and we have different doctors coming on and starting to discuss it live while we're watching the news about the strain evolving or, or new cases. So it's like a very new experience. That's why Elon jumps in here and there because it, it's a, a new form of media. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a hell of a, hell of a few months. Reminds me of my Clubhouse days because I used to do the same on Clubhouse at, at its peak. So I used to have the biggest daily room on Clubhouse when Clubhouse peaked. And then obviously Clubhouse died. I took a break, you know, went back to my companies and now space is, is uh, my focus blowing up again. So uh, it's uh, been pretty cool. Well, we love it. We love being around entrepreneurs. Uh, kudos uh, to you and all of your success and what you're doing. Lee and I are big believers that uh, crypto is going to be a big part of our future as well. So we'll look forward to uh, not only watching you and following you, but, you know, we'd love to do a follow up on this show as, as you grow and IBC grows and talk more about this very exciting stuff. Well, and Ted, I'm going to tell Lee the following. Lee, replace your aura ring with this. Significantly more convenient and you won't keep losing it like I lose my aura ring. I that see you wearing is it. Is that a whoop band? That yeah, it is band. the whoop. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, and, and Lee, we should definitely, uh, I'm not sure if Ted, you're into biohacking as well, but if email me after this, I'd love to connect and uh, connect you to my team and see what you're doing, what we're doing from a biohacking perspective and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, share notes. 
Wonderful. Mario, listen, thank you so much for coming on the program. No questions. Stick around, Mario, because I'm not letting you go yet. I'm going to take five minutes of your time. But listeners out there, th this is just a tip of the iceberg regarding crypto, regarding the success Mario have had. No question. Go out. Obviously, go back to our YouTube channel. And we spoke about it today on the show. Go find our show with Dr. Michael Bruce, the leading sleep doctor, not only in the United States, but the country. Good friend of ours out of Los Angeles. We learned so much about it being a process and not just closing your eyes. Mario, thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. And that is the shrimp tank. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.